Mm -hmm. A good many are friends that are mutual. You know, the Veneerings have met mutual friends with the Podsnaps. And, <laughs> and Mr. Twimlow tries to figure out whose oldest friend he is. <laughs> it's just very <clears throat> curious. I love the book because it happens, the story happens in Blackheath, which is where I used to live in London. Oh, really? Oh, oh yeah. Wonderful. So, and Dickens, as ever, is so perfect at describing things that mm -hmm. he can bring things back to life, you know, but. Uh, right. And I just, I just think it's a, like all of his stuff, I'm afraid I like it all. It's difficult to differentiate and say, that's my very favorite. Oh, yes. I can't do that either. Right. <laughs> well, so we're lucky we've got more than one edition, aren't we? Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. I spent a lot of time with this one doing my graduate uh, dissertation on it. But and so I, I think it's one that, you know, because I spent so much time with it. But there are others that I find uh, equally, equally interesting. So. Vicki, uh, when you mentioned that description of, you know, his descriptions of the city, it's the first time I used to be a columnist in New York and Baltimore and Washington, and I did stories on buildings. Um, but I, I really got the sense this time around that he could walk down a street and just populate the buildings with right. people, right? <laughs> just by where they were, what they looked like. Right. I mean, and so his whole life you know just walking around london it's not just looking at buildings it's like putting the persons in too you know but it's it's also that he managed to make it so real for the readers that he, he focused them on making changes mm -hmm. so you know you think about to me you have to remember it was the middle class he was writing for right people who had enough time to read things and he managed to make people have a social conscience and you know when you think of Vietnam if you'll excuse me because I was an outsider at the time it was that poor little girl with her back on fire yes ignited the whole of the world to the terrors that were going on mm -hmm. and it's like Dickens did the same for me because he opened my eyes and of course I grew up near the jail where he used to be and I watched them change that and other stuff as well. So there's a heck of a lot of Dickens that I associate with places that I know and love. You know, it's just, it's part of why you've got me here. Yeah. <laughs> we're, glad, we, we're glad you the book did that. Thank you. <laughs> and that you're here. I am too, I'm not complaining, but uh, yeah. It's it's just amazing to think of, you know, you think about people who've changed the world. Mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. And then, of course, you've got Harry Potter. Right. Sorry, they both did. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, shall we get started, Karen? Yes, yes. Well, hello to everybody. Uh, I'm so glad. Let me kind of see all the faces here. Uh, lovely to have you here. I hope that you had a good Thanksgiving uh, if you're in the United States, and if you had a good, that you had a good week uh, if you're uh, not. And uh, we're going to start and see where this takes us. Uh, we're going to begin thinking about a theme. And that is a pattern, rather, not so much a theme, a pattern of, of characters trying to create spaces for themselves or for other people. And um, it's not clear how well, how this connects yet to the, to the title, but it may be that our mutual friends help us to uh, create spaces or to be free of spaces or to um, identify dangerous spaces for us. And uh, so we'll, we'll just see uh, how we're going, if that's, if that's okay. All right, so we're gonna begin actually 
uh, in the in the uh, conversations, thinking about the conversations that we started last time. And is there anything in any one of those conversations that we had last time that you would like, oops, particularly to continue uh, uh, now? I know they're for Jackie. That's why I've got them out. They've got to go. Mm -hmm. Anything out? Anyone? Uh, is there some conversation you'd like to continue? We're going to spend a little time uh, at. at uh, in book two, we didn't really finish uh, book two, and part of that was deliberate so that it would help us this time we could think about book two and three since this space building really, really gets underway and develops some momentum um, in, in book two and then consumes a good bit of, of our thinking energy, I think, uh, and the character's energy in book three. But anything before that you'd like to think about as we go along? Any conversation from the last two times you'd like to continue? Well, let's just forge ahead and we'll see. Hi, Gail. Something you would like to continue, or are you just joining us? I was, <clears throat> I mean, I, this is may go someplace you don't want to go at all, all right, right now. But no, I was just, that, the thing of reading that we talked about before, uh, yeah. um, it became so important in the speaking countenance. I don't yeah. know, were you going to go there later with uh, Venus? Um, uh, Weg keeps saying to Venus, you have a speaking countenance. And yes, I don't know, I'm just so intrigued by characters who read one another or try to read one another and sometimes succeed and sometimes fail. It just seems I, to become really important in this book. I, I Yes. Well, and the act of uh, being able to read, because we have Lizzie Hexham, one yeah. of the things that Eugene Rayburn provides for her is a way to learn to read. And then she and and her friend, the doll maker, Jenny Wren, find their own teacher, too. Uh, and I think the whole business of reading, reading faces, reading self, reading environments, reading places, um, mm -hmm. are these safe or dis safe or unsafe places? Is this a wise or unwise text that someone is creating for me? Uh, do I like the text of my life, my life story that someone is building for me? And of course, we watch the Lammels just create themselves wildly uh, from nothing, but but and dangerously so for Georgiana Podsnap. And we discover, um, and really, what is an intriguing and very uh, very um, I think um, not so much frightening, but fascinatingly wicked uh, conversation between Safrania and Alfred as she is cre spinning this story of how Alfred could take Rokesmith's place as the secretary. Yeah. And he keeps saying, go on, go on, my love, go on, <laughs> need me more, you know, and and uh, and I think that's, that's it. So I think, yes, certainly we would want to do that because we're gonna be talking, as we talk about uh, the places people have made, those are always tied up with, with reading and narrative, self-narratives, uh, stories we tell, uh, how we read situations. And we're going to watch Betty Higdon read a situation uh, in a most interesting way. And then Miss Milby also read a situation. Um, so I think that I think that's great for us to keep that going along mm -hmm. as we as we proceed. Any anybody any other idea that you'd like a conversation you'd like to continue? Um well, this is related to that, actually, okay. or the spaces thing. But um, I just became uh, fascinated with the whole uh, idea of metamorphosis yeah. and um, changing identities and constructed identities, especially constructed families. You yeah. know, that Sloppy is more, the, the Betty is more than a mother to Sloppy, that the Boppins, you know, it goes on and on, these different right. uh, relationships. Yeah. Right. But also people's names, people's clothes. When Bella goes back home, 
she puts on everything down to the bonnet that she was wearing before and right away they know she's back literally yeah. and figure to and then just all the different names and you yeah. know and places people can be but um but i i get the sense that um I always, I still feel like Dickens is is revisiting so much of. I haven't read. I've read the first six books of his. I haven't read all the others, some of them, but revisiting <laughs> so many of the books that I have read of his, and I almost feel as if the one change is this idea of fluidity of identity, <laughs> um, right. and that people have power over it. It's not yeah. just something that's bequeathed to you, and you have to live with it. Right. Right. Um. Just a moment, I'm writing that down. Okay. Yes, and that uh, the, the, they can't choose. And sometimes they, sometimes other circumstances they make the choice not work very well or not work at all. Um, as we find out with Bradley Headstone, well, and that becomes even more clear in, in the final book. So yeah, it's great. So wonderful, more metamorphosis reading. Um, uh, reading mirrors too. There, there's some more mirrors here. Um, interesting one as we begin to see the re the mirror the river as a mirror <laughs> as well. So, okay, terrific, wonderful, wonderful. All right, what fun this is going to be. Okay, so we're going to look back at book two, and then we're going to look at building spaces uh, uh, in book three. Is that okay with everybody? Thinking also uh, about metamorphosis, about fluidity, um, and about reading ourselves, reading others, and maybe just reading because we're going to watch Mr. Boffin turn himself into a miser uh, by making and 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 uh, when we get to book four, um, I will ask your patience a little bit to to talk about a theme that is also. Uh, significant to me, and that's the whole notion of regeneration. You know, can I be, can an adult be born again? <laughs> Remember, that's Nicodemus's question. What must I do to be born again? How can a person who's an adult re-enter his mother's womb and become born again? And uh, that's the question he asks this Nazarene prophet in the middle of the night. And he comes in the middle of the night and cloaked up so that no one will see that he what a member of the Sanhedrin has come. So that's interesting. What can I do? Can I change myself? Uh, even if I, if I wanted to. Okay, so let's just proceed. We're going to take this tour and we're going to start with the death of Johnny. All right. And uh, I just need to move this a little bit up here so I can see what's on my slide. There we go. No. Okay. It's not going to work too well. Anyway, oops, I went the wrong way. I'm going too fast wrong, but let me go back. One of the things about PowerPoint is it does exactly what you ask it, whether you intended to do it or not, whether you intended that to happen or not. Okay, so here we are. Now, this is Johnny, and he's in the hospital, and he's dying. And the thing to remember is that this number would have come out in Christmas, at Christmas time. And that the, and, and Dickens makes a comment about the hospital in one of his, uh, in one of his articles, he was a supporter of the hospital and of the uh, pictures that were all through the children's hospital, the charity hospital that had been built. And so he's a member of a little family, all in quiet beds, except the two playing dominoes in little armchairs at a little table on the hearth. He has the ark on his table. Thinking of his place, Johnny bequeaths his toys to others with a weary and yet pleased smile and with an action as if he, as if he stretched his little figure out to rest. The child heaved his body on the sustaining arm and seeking Rokesmith's face with his lips said, a kiss for the boofer lady having now bequeathed all he had to dispose of and arranged his affairs in this world, Johnny, thus speaking, left it. So he was in one place and then he came into another place with the Boffins and they came too late with his illness. Betty Higdon, still caring for him, came too late with his illness. Then 
Dickens takes us to um, the child's burying and uh, the ecclesiastical concern uh, of the English church that's perhaps the dead were buried too, hopefully. And this Reverend Frank Milby, of course, this is the, he's a most, an interesting character because he's the only positive representative of the Church of England in any of the novels. Um, and he, he, he noticed that this is a quote from the novel. Reverend Frank Milby, Milby, Milby was a forbearing man who noticed many warps and blights in the vineyard wherein he worked and, and did not profess that they made him savagely wise. He only learned that the more he himself knew in his limited human way, the better he could distinctly imagine what omniscience might know. So he can't really tell about omniscience and that what he's talking about is a, an argument that was going on in the English church. And it, it, as we come at the end of our conversation, we'll talk about this other big argument and that is uh, who really was uh, saved in baptism. Uh, the notion of salvation and baptism. And in the the baptismal, I mean, the uh, funeral service says in the cemetery that we commend our sister or brother uh, in the sure and hope and sure and certain hope of resurrection to eternal life. And the argument in the English church at that time was perhaps some people really aren't good enough that we can say sure and and uh, certain hope. And you see, that's part of that reading. How do we read the service of baptism? How, I mean, of, well, baptism and um, burial. How do we read that holy writ uh, over someone? How do we read the experience of death? How do we read um, uh, the situation, the value of the individual person? Okay. Now, Mrs. Boffin. She has read her plan differently now, and she's getting ready. Remember, this is in book two. This little desk has made me ask myself, ask myself the question, seriously, whether I wasn't too bent upon pleasing myself. Else why did I seek out so much for a pretty child and a child quite to my liking? Wanting to do good, why not do it for its own sake and put my tastes and likings by? Well then, I have been thinking, if I take any orphan to provide for, let it not for a pet and a plaything for me, but a creature to be helped for its own sake. See, that's a very interesting statement, a very deep statement, and it connects to um, the, what's coming in the novel. How do we help each other? How do we, how do we legitimately help each other? Provide for it, let it not be for a pet. Wanting to do good, why not do it for its own sake and put my tastes and likings by? So we need to have this in our reading section, of this in our, our sense of, of, uh, of, of uh, understanding uh, metamorphosis. If I'm going to help someone metamorphose or if I'm going to be part of this, then I, I may need to think very clearly about my own intention. And, and this, it's very interesting that it comes, of all people, from one of the most generous characters in the novel, and that's Mrs. Boffin. And you all just jump in. I'm going to be, we're going to kind of go through this sort of quickly so we can get to book three. But whatever, whatever interests you, just stop the train. We won't get off. Okay. We'll just, just hold it for a minute. Okay. Yeah. Um yeah, I would like to add too. what struck me about that passage with Mrs. Um, Boffin mm -hmm. is also she's looking towards the future now uh, yeah. that when she found the little Johnny, she was looking backwards. Exactly. And, yeah. Right. Uh, can I also ask looking to what you said be just before that, whether the Church of England at that time had any concept of the idea of purgatory or someplace after death? where you could perfect yourself or whether they really thought that it would be the way in which you died that would determine your future? Well, the Church of England at, at this time, after 1851, had 
uh, many had had some cracks in it because in 1851, the, the Mount controversy uh, had to do with a, a, a bishop who had basically censored a, a, cur a curate for insisting that children could not be regenerate in baptism. And that set off, literally, that set off a nationwide debate to the point that people's dinner table conversation had to do with mm -hmm. the nature of, re of baptismal regeneration. So I think that connects to this, you see. How can we be sure and certain? And the, the issue was, is this an issue of grace or is it an issue of human effort? Mm -hmm. You see, if it's an issue of grace, then yes, we can say the sure and certain, it's not sure and certain fact, it's sure and certain hope. And they didn't have, they didn't have the, uh, I guess the very, the very Roman influenced churches might have a sense of purgatory, but not so much mm -hmm. the, the uh, average Anglican. So. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but this whole business, you see, is who gets to say who get, we're reading the script, reading the service, even, and how does how can that be read? Context. Okay, so now, now this is Bradley Headstone. Okay, and I put his his name here in in a moment of peak and not capital letter. So that was that's and Miss Peace. I put them all at the same level. My allusion was to this matter of your having put aside your brother's plans for you and given the preference to those of Mr. I believe the name is Mr. Eugene Raper. I'm a man of strong feelings and I have strongly felt this disappointment. I do strongly feel it. I don't know what I feel. Some of us are obliged habitually to keep it down. I cannot doubt, Mr. Headstone, that your visit is well meant. I have nothing to tell Charlie but that I accepted the help to which he so much objects before he made any plans for me, or certainly before I knew of any. Jenny and I find our teacher very able and very patient, and that she takes great pains with us, so much so that we have said to her, we hope in a very little while to be able to go on by ourselves. Isn't that interesting? a matter of space and place without the capitals at the front of their names. Only I did capitalize headstone in the middle. So Lizzie is beginning to be, a, she's beginning to think, and she and, and uh, Jenny are beginning to think of themselves as their own planners to go on by ourselves, to go on independently. Let's have a talk, said Jenny, about Mr. Eugene Rayburn. I wonder whether he's rich. Not rich, no, not rich, poor, I think, for a gentleman. She knows he has failings, wait. She knows he has failings, but she thinks they have grown up through his being like one cast away for the want of something to trust in and care for and think well of. And you see, she's beginning to read, to use that, that, that pattern. She's beginning to read or imagine she's reading Eugene Graver. Okay. And she's paying it close attention. So these are, these are sort of bridging moments in book two that push us into, into something interesting in book three. All right. Now this is uh, John Harmon, Roke Smith, uh, all of them, Hanford, all of them, lost. And like most people, so puzzled, he, again, he's gone back, he's gone back to Limehouse Hole to try to understand where he was attacked and what happened because he realizes now he was, he was drugged with something very strong. He again and again described a circle and found himself at the point from which he had begun. This is like what I've read in narratives of escape from prison, said he, where the little track of the fugitives in the night always seems to take the shape of a great round world on which they wander as if it were a secret law. 
There he ceased to be the oakum-headed, oakum-whiskered man on whom Miss Pleasant Riderhood had looked and allowing for his being still wrapped in a nautical coat became as like the same lost, lost wanted Mr. Julius Hanford as never a man, a man like another in this world. In the breast of the coat, he stowed the bristling hair and whisker. In a moment, as the favoring whim went with, went with him down a solitary place that it had swept clear of passengers. Yet in that same moment, he was the secretary also. Mr. Boffin's secretary for John Rokesmith, too, was like the same lost wanted Mr. Julius Hanford as never man was like another in this world. So we be if we if we have not understood that uh, John Rokesmith is more than he seems, we're getting the straight information here. There's actually three. John, he is uh, John Harmon, Julius Hanford, and is he possibly a fourth person as well as uh, John Rokesmith? This is pretty, this is good enough, I think. So now we're, we're having to read him differently. And suddenly this, uh, Uh -oh. Speaking countenance is the one of Julius Hanford. Okay. Interesting. Any observation before we pass on? Well, move on. Now, this is John Harmon talking, or John Rokesmith thinking back about John Harmon. So why should John Harmon not come to life? He has passively allowed those dear old faithful friends to pass into good use of it, of the fortune, effacing the old rust and tarnish on the money. Because they have virtually adopted Bella and will provide for her, because there, enough, there is enough in her nature and warmth in her heart to develop into, into something endearingly good under favorable conditions. Again, he's reading Bella. Okay. Because her faults have been intensified by her place. And, and that in my, oh, there's a typo. Sorry about that. I'm not sure what that is. That's Will. And she is already growing better. Because her marriage with John Harmon, after what I've heard from her own lips, would be a shocking mockery of which I must always be conscious and which would degrade her in her mind and me in mine and each abuse in the others. Now that's a good description of Sophronia and uh, Alfred Lamel, isn't it? Mockery. Both of them degraded by the connection that they have made. Any, any observation, let's stop for a minute. Take a mental breath and see what we have. Nice. Yes. Um, no. What do you want to, what idea do you have? Lana? I think she's coming in. Okay. We'll come in when you when you get the the signal straight. And it looked like a little problem with the signal. Okay. Can I can yes. I say something about um, resurrection? Yes, because I, I just read the um, the uh, an amazing scene with uh, Riderhood. Yes, who, I mean they all think, "Oh, he'll come back as a better man." Right, uh -uh. <laughs> it doesn't happen. No, <laughs> he, he doesn't. But I'm just wondering about John Harmon, who 
is the instrument of change in others, but does he himself change? You know, is he himself actually resurrected in any way in the novel, or is he just a static kind of instrument for others to um, become something else? I mean, that's just, I mean, to throw that out for later, because- right. Yes, yes, <clears throat> yes. And I think that's, uh, I think, uh, you know, he has been passive and we'll have to see well, by the end of book three, we see that they are, he is much more actively dealing with Bella. Because when he has been, when he has been attacked by Mr. Boff, well, when Sophronia has created the, uh, the midnight conversation with Mr. Boffin, where they're going to uh, create the idea that Mr., that Rokesmith is going to um, somehow uh, betray Mr. Boffin, and that perhaps Alfred would be a good, <laughs> a good substitute as a secretary, because they're going under, they don't have any money, and they're, they are <clears throat> uh, sort of, a bar they borrowed everything, and their, their possessions are about to be put on public sale by Mr. Raya, at the requirement of Fascination Fledgeby, so yeah, so he's it's so it's very interesting. He suddenly finds himself a wash again. Okay. And uh and Bella as well. She's we want to look at that when we when we get there. Uh, yeah, he is he is a change maker, and yet we don't know about his his being changed. And yeah, I'd like you to think about two R words there: resurrection and resuscitation. Because what we see with a writer hood is a resuscitation of the same old guy. Yeah. And there's no, and, and the people know that. And this is not a resurrection unto a new life. He's, he's come back to consciousness, but it's the same consciousness. And gradually um, uh, his, his daughter sees the people move away, go back to their own business. And he is of no interest to them, uh, particularly, uh, because he's just resuscitated. And uh, so, but you're you're absolutely right to see that. I think that, and that's because her faults have been intensified by her place. You see, and she is already growing better. She's already growing better in the influence of the Boffins. Um, um, about the uh, resurrection of rogue riderhood or the failure thereof i found a really interesting echo in the death scene with betty higdon yes. um with the back and forth it was almost felt like a religious service the back and forth um, of the conversation and and the final kiss on the lips and it felt very much of a transfiguration yes. um and <laughs> yeah and i'd like you says, to talk about that yeah. yes and when she says to lizzie will you lift me up and the narrator then takes over and says, and she lifted her up to heaven. Um, yes. You know, physically holding her up so she could breathe, but, and she lifted her to heaven. Right. L yeah. Literally resurrecting her by right. lifting her up. Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, uh, and, um, and, you know, the, there are uh, many say, or some say, that all this is, we're just reading, we are reading into the text too much. That not really. Um, uh, if we have, um, J. Hillis Miller said wrote that the one thing we have to remember about the Victorians is that they they knew religion and they may not have practiced it, they may not have believed it, but they knew it, um, and they also knew scripture more than uh, more than a little, and would respond to uh, various uh, even sort of tangential. Uh, references to scripture so because um, the naughty boffin the nicodemus boffin nobody would none of the readers would miss that a nicodemus except those who might live in um, tom all alone's <laughs> with the little boy from uh, but you see they were not literate so <coughs> now here are the places of others <coughs> So I thought we could just kind of launch off here. So Betty Higdon has a very notion of her place and the place she doesn't want to be, doesn't she? 
she sees herself as as uh, keeping she's a minder or she keep takes care of a babysitter takes care of children and she uses the mangle or has sloppy use the mangle and uh and then what about Lizzie Hexham and the Boffins? What about their the places of others, both in book two and three, but particularly we could focus on book three. What's Lizzie's place at the first part of the novel? Sorry. In the beginning, Lizzie is her father's daughter and her brother's sister. Right. And that seems to be her role. And her physical place in the world is in a some kind of dwelling close to the river. Right. And in the part we just read, it's like her and Jenny Wren make their own place in space. Yes. And they're they have their own household. Yes. You know, yes. She is no longer the daughter and the sister, she is a wage earner. So yeah. she has a different place in the wider world. And she is taking care of her own life and working with this younger person and sort of forming their own family and their own home. Exactly, right. And and so she is making a space, she is making a place, she's making an identity for herself too. Um, and she doesn't want to in book two to give it up. Uh, to her brother she says i i have managed right um charlie what about charlie we could go back to hard times and think about the other charlie right it isn't that uh, uh louise's brother isn't he also charlie of hard times it doesn't matter i just thought it was interesting if he is but mm -hmm. he, he's the young man on the rise, right? He's going to get up from being a, a gaffer's uh, son into respectability. And he's gonna be the newly minted man. Doesn't work much for Luis's brother in hard times. And certainly we don't know how well it's gonna work because Charlie sort of fades out uh, of the action, particularly when we get into book four. And then our favorite, our favorite uh, narcissist, spas slash schizophrenic, uh, Bradley Headstone. I love the name, don't you? <laughs> Grave marker or blockhead. It's hard to know which or both. And both. <laughs> And also that one scene where uh, his head completely uh, encompasses his body. That's all yeah. it is, is the right. head, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And see, he's the, he is the sort of middle class or lower middle class ideal. Uh, he would, and the middle class didn't mean in Victorian England what it would mean to us now because, but it, you know, he is, he is a self-made man and he's gone to school and he has been trained and he has very appropriate clothing. Um, and he is a person of authority in the school over the children. He's an expert and uh, and very Bradley, Bragley. I don't know, you know, if you don't have to, if you sort of must muff up that uh, Ace Bragley headstone, uh, very satisfied with himself. And yet, and yet he come, he has to face the fact that what he's got isn't enough. That may be the uh, the mental problem uh, for many Americans right now. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yes, a really interesting thing where he dresses uh, as the barge man. He, yes. he dresses lower, and right. the comment is he 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 always looked like he was wearing somebody else's clothing before, and it finally looks like he's wearing his own. Yeah, you know? exactly. And, he's uh, so yeah. uncomfortable passing. You know, he's just. Yes. <laughs> a bundle of tension. Right. <laughs> yeah. Passing is, yes. Yeah. Uh, anybody? Yes. Uh, to, yeah. 
Uh, yes, a question for you, Karen, or anybody else who may know. Um, are Eugene Rayburn, in, in, in the eyes of the, uh, of the Victorians who are reading this, are Eugene and Bradley considered to be in the same class? If not, can some of their interaction, which Bradley finds so um, unappealing, be uh, a reaction to being dissed from someone who's had a from a higher class? Um, right. Uh, 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 the he is of the higher class than Headstone. Uh, his father is well-to-do and Eugene's purpose is to be educated and to engage in, in the sort of semi-professional world of law. And so he is not, he's not, he is higher up the scale than Bradley Headstone. Thank you. But he is not, yeah, he is not. He is, I guess he could be called a gentleman but he has no, he has no um, hereditary title. He's just the son of a professional person. Did that make sense? Yes, it, it, it does to me. I'd be interested here if there anyone else had a react, had the reactions that I did that mm -hmm. some of this has to have been class. Uh, yes. Uh, I don't know what the right word is. But anyway, thank you very much, Karen. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you want to answer? Say, well, could I could I say one thing? I'm absolutely. not sure. So even two. You could even say two. <laughs> well, see if I can say it in two. Um, the um, it's kind of a tri well, it's definitely a triangle mm -hmm. uh, among Lizzie Hexham and Bradley Headstone and Eugene Rayborn. Right. Rayburn. <laughs> And um, so, and it's just my sense that they represent uh, the levels of society. Lizzie, I mean, you got to think of her as the lowest, even though we, yes. oh yes, yeah. you know, she's been presented as refined just by mm -hmm. nature. Uh, and then you've got Bradley, who's come out of the, you know, the lower and and made a place for himself among the middle class. Right. And then you have um, Eugene, who is just like a golden boy and has been given all the advantages. And yet he doesn't, he just doesn't identify with those advantages, except insofar as he can lift up. I mean, I'm sorry, that's a little pejorative, but lift up. Lizzie Hexham from her illiterate state to a higher state because he recognizes something in her that is beyond class. Right. Yeah, he's reading her. Uh, when we talk about reading someone, he's reading her authenticity, I think, and that she is she's going to be her own self. Um, whether regardless of social situation. Right. Well, that really helps. Yeah, she's is, she is authentic, and he has he's stuck. Um, think about the think about this is this is a little higher than his status, but the closest thing I can think of, you know, at three o'clock on third, at quarter to four Houston time on Sunday, closest thing I can think of is a Yale graduate uh, with a successful father who hasn't yet found his place or made his place. Does that make right. sense? Yeah. And that's yeah, so a little bit higher than, than where uh, Eugene is. But you see, Eugene and Lightwood are invited to the Venerics. You see, so they are, uh, they are not of, of Mr. Twemlow because they don't have any, any uh, uh, titled nobility in their, in, their, right. in their families. But they are uh, recognized uh, professionals. Uh, now the nobility would would you know sort of sneer at them as imagining themselves to be of value when they are not, but that's not they're in that they're in that smash of 
of the newly minted wealthy and the uh, newly recognized or being recognized uh, professional class. I see what's interesting about that is that was Dickens. You see, he was a court reporter. You see, so, so what is his claim to fame besides being this tremendously popular writer? You know, do we, do we consider our writers, people who make up fiction, uh, significant? And he was becoming wealthy, but not wealthy enough to, to really matter. Did that help at all? Mm -hmm. I think this is one of Dickens's problems too. Is it not also something to do with education? Because Eugene would be a public school boy. Yes. And public, and I always remember reading that a public school boy, you know, who somebody who'd been to Eton or something like that, even if he was a beggar, would be a higher yes. social class yes. than anyone below him. And yeah, he would have born yeah. into a different class. Right. He would have had the well. He would have had the the. Um, the sort of shaping of the of the world at Eton and that and the uh, associations, even if they would have been strained between himself and people and uh, boys or young men of, of other classes. Yeah. So we have a, a oh, number of hands up, but I'm I just want to. I can't see them, so God no, is. No, God it's is okay. Important. So I'm just going to uh, read off the list and then help Good. people through it. So we That's have fine. Glenna, then Vicky, then Wayne. Ben oh, David, okay. Cynthia, and Jane Ann. <laughs> so, okay. How exciting. Let's hear from everybody. Okay. So, Glenna, why don't you get us started? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, thankfully. Um, I think, uh, well, I think Eugene, uh, excuse me, I think Bradley Headstone <laughs> is one of the most interesting characters in all of Dickens yes. because to me, he's such a convincing um, portrait of an obsessive person. And I think, you know, yes, he, he projects all this confidence and he's boasting of his, you know, of his accomplishments, but he clearly has a gnawing insecurity. Yes. And he has had to work so hard for, in the scheme of things, relatively little. And Eugene, aside from the, the um, contest over Lizzie, Eugene, was born with advantages Bradley never had, and he's contemptuous of them. He yes. doesn't. He doesn't uh, try and maximize them. He just. He just uh, loafs through life at this stage, and that has to be maddening to somebody who's worked so hard and and feels so insecure in his uh, place in society. Exactly, and and Eugene has. Gary, can you get that phone? Uh, he has a uh, a natural ease that just irritates Bradley. You know, just really gets under his skin like a like a whole bottle full of ants. Yeah, and that's the ease of the person who has good manners, who has has had experiences that Bradley could never have. If he had them, he wouldn't appreciate them. Right. Okay. Let's go on. Uh, Vicky. You have to unmute yourself. Hello. Sorry. No I, I kept feeling that Dickens is walking around London and as he walks, he's changing his perspective. Mm -hmm. And all the way through that, it's Dickens who's who's telling you that he's changed and in the way that the story is. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I wanted to say is that it was important in these times that everybody knew their place in the social world. Yes. You had to know your status and you identified into your status at everything you did. And it was essential that you knew how to behave that way for you to survive within your status. And of course, everybody who wasn't in that status was jealous of it. It was par for the course. It was the way in a way, in sorry, in a way in which you knew you were at that level because you need sniveling little people who were jealous of you as part of the whole package. Right. And right. in fact, 
the English educational system actually started in those times. Yes. And it, it started because there were too many children who were surviving, they were not dying as they were previously in those numbers. I'm not telling they didn't die, but they did, they did survive. And the curriculum at the school was based upon religion. Mm -hmm. yes. All of the kids who went through the school and the Victorians were very thorough in making sure millions did or hundreds did, they all had to know the status of the teachers who were teaching and they had to know their religious law, the, the things that were acceptable religious wise. It was a really important part of their education. Right. And certainly, you know, when I was a teacher, every day you had a religious service you had to attend. Mm -hmm. and you needed to know that. You right. were tested on it. It was part of what you knew. And of course, I remember my stuff too, because Okay, I wasn't in Dickens's time, but you know, it was part of <laughs> very much forced education and being a, a teacher here in America where you weren't allowed to teach religion right. was quite a different perspective than being a teacher in England where you had to teach it. Right, right. Um, and I, I just feel Dickens very much here. I feel yes. he's yes. making his changes on his perspective just like all the people around are on their own. Yes, yes, yeah. And I think this is part of his um, uh, his issue of place. Uh, because if you think about Bleak House, think about the novels, and then we'll go on to the others who have questions or comments. Um, you know, the Bleak House works because they escape the city. It's also an issue of the city into the, into the green world. And so can you survive in the city, can you make it in the city, and can you make it in us in an environment where things are are slowly grindingly uh, changing? And can you can you do that? And we see him change from writer to go back to more newspaper, then back to writing, and then the speaker, the dramatic speaker, and uh, and it's it's a very interesting situation to watch him uh, go through various kinds of permutations in his own uh, creativity and in his own um, uh, sense of sense of place and belonging. He also uh, takes on the the uh, the actress as well. So very interesting. Okay. Okay, a uh, Wayne and then David. Hi, Wayne. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. I I can't remember the name of the scholar who used to attend the universe mm -hmm. when it came to Bradley Headstone and the fact that he's uh, <clears throat> risen or tried to rise in mm -hmm. social scale by dint of learning. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I remember the professor's comment was, it's too bad Dickens isn't more welcoming yeah. by representing this teacher if, if you know Bradley is representative, then it's mm -hmm. a pretty damning right. picture. I think one problem with Bradley in Dickens' view, and this kind of builds on what you've been saying, is that the teacher doesn't quite have a place yet. Mm -hmm. He's kind of on a sliding scale. Right. And it confuses him as well as other people. Mm -hmm. I can relate to it somewhat because my father was an Episcopal priest. Mm -hmm. And it always, it always kind of threw people. The, we didn't really belong to the country club set. Right. We also belonged to the church. <laughs> right. Oh, I can but see. But we weren't yeah. really accepted by the, by the working class either. Right, right. So yeah. uh, it, there was a difficult way to make connections in that, in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, I can, yes, I Thank think you. that's a really good analogy. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, that's, that would be very true. Yeah, great. Okay, David? Uh, one of the things that surprised me when I went to England for the first time 
was that the people I met who were mostly Oxbridge types mm -hmm. uh, were by American standards quite rude. Yes. Yeah. And I realized <laughs> that part of the British education, certainly in Dickens's time and still continuing for the for the people who were who get a good education, who are upper middle class or higher, is that they're taught how to be rude to people who are their inferiors. Mm -hmm. Eugene is busy practicing this. Mm -hmm. And Bradley, who knows that he, for all his virtues, is socially below Hi. Eugene, who is an idler. Yes. And Bradley writhes under Eugene's taunting him. Right. Um, yeah. And yet both of them are sort of wandering around and the fact that Eugene can in, entice him in book three uh, to follow him around the city is terrible. And he knows that's what he's doing. He's uh, poking him, as they would say, poking him with a stick. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Good on. Go, yes, hi. Uh, Cynthia and then Jane Ann. I appreciate expanding place to include not only geography, but to include class. Yes. Yeah. And I have really wondered about Rayburn and Headstone because, you know, Headstone wanted to marry Lizzie, but Rayburn wanted to seduce her. Mm -hmm. And that is a class difference, I think. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until, um, well, much later that that changed. And I think that we are meant to see that as a class difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there are many parallel relationships or mirrored relationships in this book. And I think that Eugene and Bradley confused me in a way because they are both obsessed. They are equally obsessed with Lizzie. They're equally crazy about their behavior over Lizzie. And I kept wondering in these two parallel men, how am I supposed to review them or view them differently? or in a similar way. So Karen, I would love to hear about that. Hmm. Okay, and other secrets of the universe too, right? <laughs> yeah, well, let's pause on that because um, that is part of, that is one of the, uh, of the issues is they, Ray, Rayburn has a place but doesn't want to occupy it because he is an idler or, he, as Lizzie very well um, may understand that he hasn't found his sense of self in that place, okay? Mm -hmm. And you see that what's so interesting about Lizzie, and she's a very interesting female character, as is Jenny Wren. Uh, these are females who are going to be able to make their way. They're not Betty Higdon. They're not Mrs. Milvey, the pastor's wife. They are women who are going to make their way. And Jenny is very, very interesting because she is handicapped. Um, and she is quite different, differently abled. Uh, but she is the, she is almost a seer of various kinds of, of, of things because she takes the, the world of society and miniaturizes it. Literally, she brings it down to her size by making the dolls. And she's apparently successful because they go to a toy shop and she then they see all of the dolls that she has made there. And they're going about doing the full-sized womanly things of upper-class people. And it's, it's very interesting that she understands them well and she understands them as dolls. And so I think what we see in, in Jenny Wren, I mean, in, in Lizzie Hexman, remember the name. Lizzie is Elizabeth. Three Elizabeths in the Bible, the mother of John the Baptist, okay, 
um, the daughter of Aaron. Oh, and I've lost the third one. Mother of John the Baptist, daughter of Aaron. Well, those are two. Okay, I'll think of the other one. Um, and and so you you know you have. It's interesting that they are, and and then Hexum. Think about the hex, the the magic, the spell maker, and the am Hexum. Her identity is a spell maker. Well, it's very interesting that she's connected to Jenny Wren because Jenny Wren, it, you know, is the is the uh, ordinary bird, and yet she is quite extraordinary in how she can can take the qualities of large size humans, minute and miniaturize them and make. Like kind of, a kind of decent profit. She's not making, she's not becoming rich, but she is able to sustain herself. And she's also dealing with a Mr. Dolls, the the mm -hmm. alcoholic yeah. dad. So I think the issue is Jenny, a Lizzie is a surprise to everybody. Um, and she's also she's been a working girl all her life because she can navigate the river. <coughs> Next, and that's going to be seriously important in book three. Mm -hmm. You see, she is a she has she has the skills of someone who is strong enough to pull that very light goat boat against the tide in the Thames. And the tidal nature of the Thames, even in in the twenty first century, is something to be very astonished at. With the with the big gates out, you know, protecting the city and all from. Uh, out at the, at the coastline, um, and so she is. She is a most interesting character because uh, she has these skills. She's ashamed, partly ashamed of her skills, but but she does them so well to please Dad and to be part of his business and to help him perhaps become a better person. And she's a visionary. She sees the the figures in the fire. Hmm. Now we have to take that back. We have to see she's not the first one to do that. Louisa also did grad guard, also does it. Except she sees it in the fires of the factory. But see, Roke Smith also looks at the fire. And that's how Mrs. Boffin recommend uh, recognizes him. And she sees him looking into the fire the same way he did as an adult, the same way he did as a child. And she recognizes him in that in that moment, in that place, because she places him. By seeing him in that place. Yeah, so, no, I, no, I think you're. This is all very, yeah. Every, all of this is just right on target, and, uh, and it's sort of like looking at the floor and a, a, uh, a spilled box that had regular, a regular deck of cards and some tarot cards thrown in. You know, mm -hmm. what do we do with this? I think we got another hand up. Uh, Jane Ann and then Phyllis. Yeah, um, it's fascinating how Dickens uses geography to yes. represent sort of the inner life or almost the illness of people. Yeah, when you say like Eugene has a place, well, Bradley Headstone has a place. His place is in the schoolroom, and what I noticed in this section is, but where is he when the, he's written about? He's lurking about the city streets of London in the dark, almost like a, a bug or something like that. Um, it, and so I just found that really interesting in this idea of places of what happens to someone who's not living in their place. Right. And yeah, it, yeah that's, I think that's really, a, really a great point. And, you, and Eugene uh, is not settled in a place even though he occupies a place with uh, like Mortimer Lightwood, uh, he's not settled and he paces around. Partly then he's pacing around to drive uh, Bradley crazy because he knows he's following him, trying to find where Lizzie is. Yeah. So, yeah. Pay attention to, to Mortimer, since we were talking about, to pay attention to Mortimer Lightwood's name. Okay. You know, we're looking at drownings and resuscitations and coming back to life. Mortal Mare is dead in the water. And yet he's Mortal Mare dead in the water lightwood. So he can float on the surface, perhaps, and not be harmed by the water. 
and you see he's he is a, a fairly um, sophisticated observer. He's one that has the voice of authority. Um, he's one that brings the news of the man from somewhere, the man from nowhere, um, and has the the story of of the of Gaffer Hexum being exonerated of the murder of John Harmon. So he's a storyteller as well, a news bringer. And that's interesting too. But it's interesting the the names too, you know. Okay. Do we have one more, one more person? Um, yeah, I think my hand is up. Um I I want to go back a little bit to uh, Jenny Wren um yeah. and Lizzie. And I think in chapter two, um, there's a lot of um, going on where Jenny Wren, there, there's always fairy tale references, you know, it's yes. the fairy godmother is Rhea and, yes. um, and, and she is Cinderella. And then when Rhea goes after the debt collection, she says, no, you're no, you're no fairy godmother. Right. And then um, <laughs> she talks about, uh, I love this quote and I don't understand it. Um, where Jenny says, uh, Rhea talks about his lost family, the, the wife, um, uh, daughter, and son of promise, and um, they're gone, but the happiness is. Mm -hmm. And then Jenny says, you had better change is into was, and was into is, and keep them so. And if that isn't a Delphic <laughs> pronounce, yes, yes. A pronouncement, right. I don't know what is. So, um, and one last thing about, I love your idea of her taking the full size world down to the doll size. I right. think that's a really, really interesting idea. And uh, when she was describing what she did, how she went and watched things and then ran back and cut them up, it reminded me of what happened in the previous book where Twemlow is pretending to look at the portrait albums while um, uh, uh, Sophronia, you know, is telling, asking him to do yes. betray her husband. Right. And you realize that, I mean, some of the people in these rooms are in these portrait albums. This is not like right. the National Enquirer where you see some movie star you've never met. No, this is right. someone who has, you just had champagne with in the right. portrait album. Yeah, yeah. Right. right. But I, I love the Jenny Wren shrinking down the world. That's a really, really cool concept. So thank you. Right. And, as she, and as she does that, she can, she can uh, see it more fully. You know, she makes it smaller and she can see it more fully. I don't, she and, she, yeah. and she can control it. Yes. And yeah. and her, her business card says, we'll visit all dolls at their premises, right? That's at their right. residences. That's so right. then you wonder, maybe she does make real people, right? Maybe she is a witch. I mean. Her, yes. Well, let's, when we get to uh, part three, we're going to see a, a very spectacular uh, piece of uh, a couple of events where she does seem to have uh, a, a uh, not so much well not so much supernatural as it is a superior understanding of a situation and the people involved in it and uh, and in that regard you know that is that is kind of a, a sort of magic a sort of witchcraft where she can see because she sees what people really say and she pokes that needle at them Oh no, she says, this is what you are. And she's poking that needle at them as she talks about it. Yeah, yeah, great, great. Yeah. And it's interesting that that uh, she's, she is handicapped, Wegg is handicapped, Mr. Dolls is, uh, you know, a staggering drunk. And then you have, uh, you have a sloppy, who is in some way mildly retarded, okay, or has a, a handicap of some other kind. No. Yeah. Okay, anybody else that we're missing? We don't want to miss anybody's observations. They're all good. Great, actually. Okay. Okay. All right, so let's think about any of these. Just, we've got a bunch of, we've got some names on the screen, kind of connected. Um, let's think about Lizzie Hexham and the Boffins in terms of place. Or places or creating places. I think there's a connection between Lizzie 
uh, and the boffins through vicariously through Bella. Yes. Okay. Right. Right. And she's on the she any any other she's kind of on the rise too in terms of getting herself educated. Uh, Mr. Raya has given her a safe place up on the rooftop first to begin to learn, come up and be dead. Um, and then in the in the Jewish community where she's working in the factory. Um, okay, what about the boffins? They started out in one place, didn't they? They're in the same place for a time uh, in the Bower. Uh, and they start out in the same place and then they move into the house in, in town. They're in two different places in terms of uh, the wealth. Mr. Boffin becomes uh, and wants to be read to and in his being read to by by a very uncertain reader, uh, Silas. I'm sorry, guys. I should say Silas and not Wyla. Silas Wig. Um, you know, they they we get an interesting view of history. Um, and Silas Wig is an interesting reader. He's also reading something into. Uh, the Boffin fortune as well. He and Mr. Venus. Mr. Venus is trying to put people together, put things together um, as a taxidermist. Okay, so we've got Lizzie and the Boffins uh, changing. Their situation's changing. Okay. All right, what Glenda. about Lizzie? Go ahead. Uh, Glenna has her hand up. Yeah, hey, Glenda. <clears throat> I, well, I wanted to say apropos of, of that, I think in some ways, um, Lizzie and Mrs. Boffin have uh, an affinity because they are both, um, you know, in some process of rising in social class, mm -hmm. but they both have a natural generosity of spirit that mm -hmm. equips them uh, for their um, change in station. And, um, and by the same token, I think some of the most delicious humor in the book has to do with uh, Mr. Boffin's reflections on uh, what the old lady wants and how she plans to proceed to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, live the fancy life and so on. But right. um, yes, I think there's a great deal of affinity between Lizzie and Mrs. Boffin. Right, right. Okay, what about Lizzie, Charlie, and Bradley Hempstone? about places. I mean, they're all starting from the same place, but you know, sort of in rising, uh, but in different ways and some more successfully than others. Right, right. Okay, what about Mr. Boffin and the Library of Misers? Because <laughs> this is reading or being read to uh, its books. He, ga he gains um, a perspective on life from the biographies of misers. Now, what we don't know is whether, at this point in book three, we think that he has become, you know, a, a, uh, a despicable person, uh, giving John Rokesmith so much difficulty. Okay, we've got raised hands, two folks. Uh, so, uh, Phyllis and then Wayne. Yeah. Do us, you want to talk to us? There we go. Sorry about that. Um, yes, I just thought it was just so funny that he becomes a my he becomes miserly about his books, and well, yes. um, you know, and and uh, and then um, miserly about he loving to think about where did they hide it in the teapot or did they hide it in the sort of in the most and in a way that's the ultimate place too, right? Is yes. this is where the the 
the helpful movers, is that what they call themselves, right. are going to do. They're going to find the place where all the wealth is. Exactly. And, uh, and, it, and, and it's a tiny little obscure place, not a high, you know, uh, vaunted place. Um, and I had an old friend of my, old friend of my mother's married a guy who had a broken down chateau in France, you know, in the 60s and was a miser. And one way he expressed that was that he would take out the jewels he had and put them on the cats, you know. Oh so there's there's something about, and there's always that money, 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 right? right. Mia says it, um, uh, somebody, that, that comes up again and again. And so what is money? Is it something to you hide in a dark place that you don't admit to? Is it something you flaunt and you parade around? Um, is it something you kill for? Uh, and um, again, I just feel like Dickens is maybe like you were saying before, Karen, that in his own life, he's he's at a point where a lot of this is sort of simmering in in his head. And I think he's taking on some of the uh, Victorian, you know, just attitudes and, and right. sort of poking at them. Right. Right. Trying this out. Yes. Yeah. That's true. And, and when we were talking about reading earlier, you see he's reading and then recreating what he's reading in, in his, uh, he's checking, chosen the readings and they're not declining and falling anymore. They're the, the misers and he's becoming like a script. He's using those at for miserly behavior. Wayne, I'm sorry, what did you, what can you add? What are you going to add? Wayne? Oh, hi. Hi. I detect a joke here uh -huh. because part of the religious training would be to read the lives of the martyrs or the lives of saints. Yes, that's but right. But instead, Botham is reading the li lives of, of, of misers. So. That's right. Instead of martyrs, misers. Yes. yes. <laughs> that's right. Yes. Yes. And I think I think that is that is one of those jokes. <laughs> that Dickens tries it tries out on I, I puts in to show uh, the the perhaps the foolishness of imagining that if I if I live uh, uh, if I read the lives of martyrs I'm going to become you know somehow saintly and self-sacrificing but but he becomes actually more miserly except you know, if you read the book I don't want to because I may I'm assuming some have not read the fourth fourth book so we don't want to spoil something here. Uh, about Mr. Boffin. So, Step on the, uh, do what? The line numbers. Yeah. Automatically. Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Sarah? Silas. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Sarah. Sarah. Yeah. Hi, Sarah. Yeah, I, uh, he, chose, he chose to learn about misers, which yes. is interesting because he's now in a new position. He's rich. And yes. when they first became rich, uh, his wife looked at new clothes or new, new, new ways of kind of living the rich life. And suddenly he, he decides to learn about misers. Right. And, and this kind of reminded me about the theme of fearing to lose something, having something and losing it. Yeah. And I, I remember, like, it reminded me, like, Jenny Rain, uh -huh. uh, she said, I was happier after she lost Lizzie because Lizzie had to go hiding. Mm -hmm. She said, I was happier before I met Lizzie than I am now that I lost Lizzie. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, I think so. So, yeah. so and I think the, the, the theme of being afraid of losing comes back when he look he looks to study misers. He's afraid to lose the money. Right. Right. And uh and that makes him um uh, very uh, now now suddenly a penny pincher, although he doesn't uh, keep Mrs. Boffin from having whatever she thinks she wants. So you know I think that's that's a very good point. Uh as you as you become accustomed to something you may become more concerned about losing it. Yeah. Right. Well, it is now on a healthy side as we look at that. That's 
really very interesting observation of, of Lizzie Hexham. As she becomes more accustomed to being, to have invested in herself and to have invested in her, her own sense of self and to be an independent person, uh, she is not going to lose that. She's taking steps not to lose that by giving up a relationship that would have made her presentable, uh, respectable, and that is to be somebody's wife. Yeah. And that's interesting too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Boff and John Rope Smith and Bella. Yeah. I, I, Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I, I thought uh, uh, it's interesting from the point of view, uh, Bella starts by saying, I want to marry somebody rich. I don't right. care about anything, just money. But she is an excellent observer and observing Mr. Muffin becoming a miser and observing Rock Smith, she is changing for the better. Right. That's right. And um, and the more that Mr. Boffin says, this girl here wants to, she's going to marry money. She understands yeah. the value of money. She is not going to marry for any other a silly reason. She's going to marry for money. And uh, and she is shamed by that. She is shamed. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. I think we've talked about Eugene and Bradley before, but any other comments we want to make about Eugene? Mortimer Lightwood understands the danger of his situation in the, in the more he taunts Bradley Headstone, the more Bradley Headstone is going to become uh, disengaged from his uh, sense of control. And he said, do not, do not push this. And uh, Lizzie Hexham says the same thing. Do not push this. Okay. So, and then we have Miss Peacher watching the whole thing. And she's the one who would be pleased to be Mrs. Bradley Headstone. She'd be pleased to, to, for that relationship. But Bradley is not interested in her at all. So that's interesting too. And she has her own house and she is a professional person, is one of his uh, uh, colleagues. And, uh, and that's interesting uh, as well. So if you think about those places, okay. Okay. Oh, sorry, I went the wrong way. Okay. Now this is Lizzie thinking about place. And this is Lizzie when uh, this, the quotation deals with Lizzie when she uh, responds to Bradley Headstone who has become totally incoherent. And he says, I generally can, sp can speak more sensibly for myself, but I am not able uh, to do that right now. Um, I am confused, I am stumbling. And I basically, he thinks, I think is trying to say, I look sort of like an idiot here. With much dignity, much of the dignity of courage, she recalled her self-reliant life and her right to be free of accountability. Mm -hmm. to she released her arm from his grasp and stood looking full at mm -hmm. him. She had never been so handsome in his eyes. Observations about these lines. Yes, David. Well, earlier when you asked about Lizzie and her brother and Bradley, each of them uh, saw her in a role where she didn't have any agency. Yes, yeah. And here, She's refusing to be uh, part of someone else's picture. Yes, right. Later on, 
what we haven't come to it yet. Bella says something well, that I is just extremely asked. good that mm -hmm. is similarly. Yes, right. I am not falling into the role in which you cast me. Right, right. That's right. Yes. Right. Okay, we got uh, Irene. Yes, I'm just uh, I'm reminded with these quotations of. Nancy and Oliver Twist in a similar situation yes. of threat to her life, but refusing to change what she thinks is important, which is right. wanting to save the child in that book and wanting to save her own freedom of account and right to account her own accountability here. Right, right. I think it's very interesting that the way this is written is and her right to be free of accountability to this man. That's extraordinarily 21st century, actually. Um, um, so it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, it is unworthy of you to speak to me this way, but it makes me able to tell you that I do not like you and that I, I never have liked you from the first and that no other living creature has anything to do with the effect you have produced upon me for yourself. Hi, Gail. Use your mic. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. I just think that's sort of the sum of wisdom in, in Dickens in a way, the self-reliant life and right to be free, because it seems like there are all these doomed uh, efforts of rising right. through the social scale, through money, you know, and marriage, which right. is kind of dicey, <laughs> marrying right. money. Um, and and that seems to be the way for the woman, as Bella Bella thinks. But they're all doomed. I mean, Bradley's effort is doomed, and and I and I was wondering why is it because Dickens has such contempt for society, for you know the heights to which people are trying to rise, mm -hmm. or or is it because there's some other essence, essential quality that's just more admirable, which doesn't have to do with rising, but just has to do with freedom, right? Uh, from accountability and the right to be oneself, self-reliant, the way Jenny Wren is, and she's a wonderful. Yes, you no, know, she's my right. hero. I love, yeah, I right. love her. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I've just been trying to think about his values and this whole thing you're talking about. Movement. It's really movement of social class. And right. more. I mean, Boffin moves from poverty, you know, um, riches to rags, or, or <laughs> the other way. Uh, rags to riches and then is threatened with a movement back anyway all right. none of that is essential you know none of that is I mean all that's mocked mocked in a way right. by since I think anyway right. it, those yeah. words that, uh, really struck me yeah this is a and uh, and it's interesting to to put what you're saying which is a, a very spot on I think into a context of trying to figure out what the title means Oh, many essays, many, many written on who the mutual friend is, you know, the man from nowhere, the man from somewhere. Uh, and and it's interesting, our mutual friend, who is that? Well, with the veneerings, our mutual friend is maybe Twemlow, maybe not, maybe Podsnap, maybe Boots and Brewer, maybe who knows? <laughs> Lady Tip, I mean, he can't figure it out. Uh, who's been uh, veneering's oldest friend? So our first friend. And uh, so that's interesting too. So anyone with money, I mean, anyone with money, yeah. That is to say, nobody at all, you know. Nobody at all. Well, you see, that might be maybe your mutual friend is maybe our mutual friend is ourselves. So, mm -hmm. uh, so <laughs> yes, somebody else is. I can't see the hi. Hey, Anna. Anna. Okay. Hi. Um, I just wanted to point out since I'm a historian of the U.S. Yes. This sounds very Emersonian, yes. as she called her self-reliant life. And of course, Emerson was in a lot of correspondence. I'm not sure whether he corresponded with Dickens, but he corresponded a lot with um, Carlyle, yes. uh, who was a friend of Dickens. And so this, this whole um, self-reliance sounds profoundly Emersonian to me. Right. Yes. Yes, I think that's... that's uh... That's right. That's right. Hi, Wayne. Hi. 
it just strikes me that I had to sort of learn the country club manners, mm -hmm. watching people table. Yes. That is, you saw someone at a table in the same room and you'd get up and greet them, even if yes. you interrupted their meal. Right. Sometimes rather loudly. But yes. the other strange behavior was asking, trying to find a common acquaintance. Mm -hmm. Oh, do you know such and such? Yeah. Or have you met such and such yet? <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. Sometimes accompanied in the South by ooh and ah. Oh, yes, so, right. <laughs> right. That's true. But it seems to me the our mutual friend is a kind of triangulation. Mm -hmm. If we have a friend in common, I think that's one of the essays makes this point that mm -hmm. it's a misleading phrase in some way. Mm -hmm but he's friend to both of us so maybe we can be friends too <laughs> yes right mm -hmm. yeah. that's right yes yeah well and that's one of the assump that's one of the uh, assumptions of the veneerings and the pod snaps and the uh, all the people who show up at the dinners they don't really have a good time but they show up and say they've been there and some don't show up right <laughs> i i think we've got is that david is that hi david um, the veneerings, of course, are socially climbing by collecting right. B-list and C-list celebrities like Donald Trump did, <laughs> right. uh, but getting away from that particular distraction, uh, mm -hmm. I've lost my thought. Uh, something Wayne said that was that got me. Uh, It'll come back. Just take a break. Was no doubt very valuable, but I should not keep you waiting on my uh, slow brain. Oh, that's all right. I have to wait on mine all the time, so I'm glad to wait on yours. <laughs> oh, I know what it was. It's. Uh, there's often something useful in W.S. Gilbert's Bab Ballads. Mm -hmm. And one of the Bab Ballads is about two guys who are shipwrecked on a small island. And they can't talk to each other because they've never been introduced. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them is at the end of the island that has oysters, which he hates. And the other is at the other end of the island. I forget what is there, and he doesn't like it. And one mm -hmm. of them is soliloquizing one day and mentions the name of a friend. Mm -hmm. The other said, "Oh, you know so and so," <laughs> and then they become <laughs> the best of friends and trade places. But a convict ship. Mm -hmm comes upon them and they're rowing in the boat coming ashore is their mutual friend after which they can't speak to each other anymore and one goes back to oysters which he hates <laughs> that's great thank you thank you for adding that that's wonderful wonderful hi I think Harry has his hand up. Oh, Harry, okay. Yes, can you hear me now? We can, yes. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't know how to put this little red hand, <laughs> yellow hand in, up there that That's I want right. to press. But it strikes me that the two quotations that are on the um, that are on the screen at the moment, Lizzie and Place, about Lizzie and Bradley Headston. It's kind of ironic. He approaches Lizzie with a view to saying, in effect, look, you're wonderful, you're beautiful. I would like to like you to marry me. Um, and that is not my true view. But she, in the in the first quote, says, no, no, um, you know. I want to be self-reliant. Mm -hmm. And she had never been so handsome in his eyes. So when she 
becomes a solid human being, it makes him want her even more. Right. When he is self-reliant or, or expresses himself genuinely saying, I really want you to marry me, mm -hmm. that has the opposite effect on her. Right. Um, it, it, makes, it makes her disliking it even more. You know, there's no other living creature um, yeah. has anything to do with the effect you've produced upon me for yourself. So right. when she's being herself, he likes that. Mm. But when he's being herself, it has the opposite effect. It's kind of right. ironic. Right. Yes, it is. It is. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's I don't know if, um, I think the whole notion of finding place, creating space for oneself, creating identity for oneself, it may be uh, in Dickens' mind something that is, um, is uh, fraught with danger, fraught with uh, risks, fraught, fraught with um, both mental and, and spiritual uh, sinkholes that can get get someone into into trouble. We we know that the Lammels, for instance, they both they they were such good frauds that they defrauded each other into believing that both of them had money, and they had none. And so uh, Sophronia is created. They, first, they go after Georgiana Podsnap and then Fascination Fledgeby and Georgiana Podsnap. And now they're going to try the, to insert themselves into the world of the Boffins. And Miss uh, and uh, Sophronia tries that with, um, with um, Bella in the conversations that she has because she's just suddenly been overcome with how how astonishing and uh, interesting Bella is. So, yeah, I think I think that's that that is a very complicated element of the of the novel. How do we do this? Um, and I think, frankly, that's something uh, Dickens never quite got for himself. I don't think he, for himself, um, overcame the um, the uncertainty that he had, uh, perhaps from uh, early teen, the early teen years in his life uh, about his identity, his place. Uh, and I think some of that, I'm not, I think the um, autobiographical fragment probably overdoes that because he was explaining too much. Um, but I think the, the fact that he was left uh, to fend for himself while his parents were in prison, his sister was actually in an arts school attending an art school, the dancing school. So he he was pretty much there to figure out what to make of himself, to make his place. So, hi. Uh, I'd just like to say that, uh, you know, I've been thinking about the title, uh -huh. which you have, um, you know, uh, asked for uh, comments about. And, um, our mutual friend, it's kind of been done with an elbow and a wink, mm -hmm. but that's at its grossest uh, expression. It's a reassurance. It's really an empty reassurance, but it is a reassurance that, you know, you can trust me. Mm -hmm. You can trust this person. And I think the entire novel revolves around uh, who you can trust. Okay. Right. Right. Can you even know them well enough to, to trust them? Yeah. That's very intriguing. Very intriguing. Right. And that would be, that would be, can you read them? You know, that would take us back to the reading um, as well and take us back to the individual's sense of space, a personal, personal space as well. And Mr. Twemlow is pretty authentic, uh, but then he is from the upper class, loosely, or, or on the coattails of the upper class. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's very interesting. Thanks for thanks for adding that to our thinking. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do we have someone else with a hand up? Hi, Carolyn. Hi, Carolyn. Oh, hi, Karen. Thanks so much for your presentation. Um, you know, this is the first time I've read. Um, oh really? Oh great! I started it once and I 
just wasn't interested, but you've made it much more interesting. Um, well, two things. I just wanted to comment. It seems to me that the dialogue in our mutual friend is the most modern I read of Dickens. It seems like he really, you know, the things are very accurate. It just seems like very modern dialogue. Um, so I just love what she said. I never liked you. Right. Yes. Right. I, yeah. People didn't usually say that. And also, I wanted to share a quilt, which might be appropriate. I was in a um, Anthony Trollope book club mm -hmm. reading Dr. Thorne. Mm -hmm. So I made this quilt. Courtney has a picture of it. Oh, good. Um, so she's going to try and share it. Okay, great. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Yes, very much. Right. <laughs> That was his mother kept saying it over mm -hmm. and over. Right. And it really was, you know, it, it might even be true nowadays. Mm -hmm. It's better to marry someone with money than not. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then not to marry or not to marry someone with money. See, that's such a that's such an interesting way that we would say that. Is I just not gonna marry at all? Or am I not gonna marry somebody who doesn't have any money? And then I better be sure that they do have what they appear to have, like the flammels confuse each other. Yeah, great. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you for thank you for that. Thank you for that. I love I love seeing the quilt. Thank you. Hi, right, Phyllis. Hi, Phyllis. There it is. Sorry. Um, That's right. Uh, uh, well, Carolyn, I agree that there's some really modern uh, passages in this. Um, um, I loved uh, when um, when the the two are professing their love um, to Mr. Wilfer, the the Feast of the Three Hobgoblins chapter, right. and um, and it it's, it almost reads like a song, a duet. You know, yes. she says, "You don't know how mean I was to him. You don't know, but you don't know how bad I was to her." Goes back and forth like that, and then there's another passage describing Mr. Dolls trying mm -hmm. to cross the street yes. in the London traffic, and I felt like I was watching a Charlie Chaplin yes. silent yes. movie. Right. It was, um, and um, it, it it's uh, the other modern aside from the self reliant quote from mm -hmm. Lizzie. I think the modern scene between um, uh, Bella and Lizzie, when they each reinforce one another's, what they had been wanting to be, and they each sincerely, I think, became that. And suddenly you don't have the Dickens heroine who either has to die or be mm -hmm. unhappily, you know, suddenly they I, were yeah. a new modern mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And last thing, this is a plug that's obscure, but I'm going to okay. make it anyway. Um, I'm in the, a reading group for Dorothy Richardson's uh, Pilgrimage, mm -hmm. which is a 13 novel work that went from over about 40 years. Um, and it is, she's born 1893. So it's the first modernist feminist novel. Mm -hmm. And it's quote unquote stream of consciousness, but it is all about the, the one, there's one main protagonist woman finding one's place. Mm -hmm. and, and it's exactly what you're talking about uh, over and over again, except for just another generation above now that you actually have. Um, but I, so I'm just feeling like it's, this is the last novel completed that he wrote. I don't know where he was in his life. I just feel as if he was just on a verge of something. Right. No, right. but that's, you know, speculation. You can't project, but it just feels like that. Yeah. I, I think it does too. And what's really strange is that the, the next book he was writing, uh, or he was in the middle of when he, not really the middle of, partly through, um, you know, is the Mr. Edward Drood, which to some extent goes back around and picks up good, pe you know, significant pieces from our mutual friend. It's very strange that it, that that that's the you know that's the one he was working on. Uh, oh, okay. I I have not read that. So now that you tell me that, that's a big incentive to do so. Well, it's it's incomplete, and people mm -hmm. try to to fiddle with it, and you know that's always a disaster when you try to right. particularly for someone like Dickens. But uh, yeah, 
it's very it's very and uh right and i think the i think the that when we when we look more carefully at the connection of bella and lizzie and particularly in the three and we see we see how they they uh, we'll see more about Bella as as uh, uh, the married woman, and Dix and both of them actually. Even I don't want to spoil this for those who haven't read the book, uh, so I'll say spoiler alert. Both of them uh, in in a very uh, interesting relationships. So because we see Bella at the end of the two, uh, recognizing her real self, into such a degree that she simply makes Rope Smith deliriously happy that she is not what he thought she might thought she might have become or not what she what not what everyone expected her to be as she had been behaving I don't know how to say that but <laughs> so okay all right someone else Gail well Bella also is going to refuse to fall into the situation of what other people Right. You know, she's going to be who she is, not who others have imagined her to be. Uh, on Merry Money, yeah, might be enjoy a Tennyson poem where he's trying the dramatic monologue, mm -hmm. Northern Farmer, New Style, where the Northern Farmer is talking to his son about marriage don't marry where money is for money but go where money is oh. <laughs> and on the speech i thought that was very profound a very good observation the early dickens novels are the speech is so often so stagey mm -hmm. very much from the theater right and it hadn't occurred to me before but it that He's broken from that here. Right, right. That's true. That's true. Okay, one one other point. Yeah. Uh, on some of Edwin Drood coming out of Our Mutual Friend, mm -hmm. there's often a point in an author's work where you can see him nibbling at the idea that's going to be his next one right Shakespeare does this a lot right there I've been all over the map on this mm -hmm. yeah now I think that I and that is true and it's hard to tell you know they, uh, uh, anyway I've just found com comments about Edward Drood as if it were a finished book uh, rotating so okay others have Important good things to say that we want to hear. So, Gail and then Glenna. Okay. I was got, I wanted to go back to that conversation between Bella and Lizzie, which is yeah. such an amazing uh, scene. And it's uh, it's the well, Bella feel strength is drawn forth from Bella as she sees this example of this mm -hmm. fine woman who she never thought she could be, but she's sort of rising to become. Um, right how people can draw out the the better or the worser selves of others mm -hmm. i just and that's of course mutuality that comes back right, to the right. notion of our mutual friend how you know can be bonds of strengthening or um you know the uh contrary example for me is pledge pledgely pledge B, whatever mm -hmm. pledgling and uh and the jew you know how he projects all his mean spiritedness and and evil really mm -hmm. onto this perfectly gentle Jew, you know, who I think has got to be a rewrite of Fagin. I don't know. There's something going yes. on yeah. terribly, that's right. terribly right. interesting. But you know, he's a per he's a sweet little man. And here here's this Gentile who projects all this uh, mean spirited, greedy, you know, da da da. But that's the other way uh that human beings can relate to it, you know, in this whole thing of interpretation and reading. If you go through life's 
seeing only images of yourself. You're not going to see a very pretty image if you are, you know, fascination pledge. But I just thought, I mean, those scenes are almost counter, you know, how one can draw out the strengths and goodness and another and the other can just, you know, whittle it down to something worse. Right. And, and, and that you said that, uh, I think uh, it is something that deepens a little bit the character of Sophronia. You know, the lamels are, lamel connects to laminar, you know, so they are literally, you know, an inch thick or, or less than an inch thick. And when they leave the novel in book three, they just simply turn a corner and disappear, just as if, you know, as if the, the laminar flow now has stopped. But we begin to see in the in the um, effort of Sophronia to save um, uh, Georgiana Hodsnap from the, the 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 machinations of getting her connected into with Fledgeby. That's that's something that is interesting. Yet she, at the same time, she makes up the story that will be the 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 next con, which is that that uh, Rokesmith wants to take over, wants to steal from Mr. Mr. Uh, Boffin. He knows all of the, where all the money is, that he knows all this, and that her husband would be such a, a much better uh, oh. for him. And listening to her, and listening to her husband cook this up is, uh, is, is uh, interesting. And it's, it's uh, the opposite of someone bringing out the best, I think. Yeah. Hi, Glenda. Hi, um, Gail, I have to tell you, you have to come to the universe because <laughs> we've had quite a bit of conversation about the relationship between Mr. Raya and Fagan. So right. y'all ah. come. Okay. Uh, but that's what I raised my hand about was, um, I want to talk about the um, penultimate chapter of book three and uh, the big disclosure of love between, um, yeah. Good. Uh, between yeah. Bella and John Rokesmith, as as we uh, think him to be, it's um, it's just amazing how how much this diverges from most such scenes that I know about in Victorian novels, because there's no you know there's no um, display of modesty on Bella's part. She's so forthright. And as I was trying to suggest with Lizzie and her self-reliance, I think that in this novel, um, Dickens is presenting female characters who are quite at variance with what we usually think of as the stereotypical Victorian uh, heroine. Uh, yeah. And I just, that scene between uh, Bella and John is, charming it's funny and it's not anything like i mean i've read so many novels where you know the heroine we know to be madly in love with a hero but she has to go through a whole show of of you know casting her eyes down and looking yes. back right. And, right and so on yeah yeah uh that's that's um i th i think that too i was uh thinking when you were talking about that, about the way that that scene develops, um, as she has come redressing herself in the past, she is and uh, she is in her in the dress that her father actually bought for her. He said, "I believe, do you have a new dress?" And she says, "No, this is one you bought for me." And that she goes to back to her home with that old dress on. Um, and it's uh, that's that is a wonderful scene, and how they have tea three times basically, um, <laughs> and, and I think that's lovely too, right? So, yes. Next time we'll start uh, focusing more on that, and then go uh, go into into uh, book four, uh, because I think that's a good place for us to begin, um, as Rokesmith. Uh, he has not yet told her the, the real that she has actually see that at one point in book four, and if even if you haven't read it, you know that sooner or later he has to tell her who she is, who he is. Um, and uh, and so he's going to present her to himself 
to, you know, John Harmon will present the bride to himself. And that's going to be an interesting, uh, an interesting moment. And, and it echoes a part of the New Testament. And I don't know what Dickens was doing with it. Okay. But in the, all of the argument against, um, ag about the church and about the elements of the church, you know, the, the, there is a notion in Christian theology that at some point, Christ will present the church in all of her redeemed and, and glorious state to himself. He will present the church to himself with exceeding great joy. And that's basically what Roke Smith does. You see, he presents Bella to himself as John, John Harmon with exceeding great joy. And you think, wow, I don't even know where to go with that. So uh, because there's, there's uh, that, that comes so so close uh, to what uh, to, to that that point of uh, of scripture and doctrine it's just very interesting and we'll also see her use her skills um, much more fully and the skills that she had been afraid of and ashamed of she makes them not so much uh, but she but that whole notion of fishers of men as well is going to become a uh, significant in book four so I'm uh, we've got a few minutes left. Any last thoughts that anybody wants to leave us with? Um, I'd like to uh, run across a quick question to think about next time is yeah. um, the role of servants and um, huh. and the analytical, of course, is one. Yeah. Um, and um, I just happened to jump through quickly a George Orwell essay um, mm -hmm. on Dickens. And just whenever he mentioned our mutual friend, I picked up a passage and he has mm -hmm. some interesting notes about that. Um, and then finally, I put this in the chat, but um, I was, I got A's in Sunday school because I never went to the teacher, um, did all my uh, assignments. Um, uh -huh. So I tried to read the Old Testament one summer when I was 15, and I did, but I don't remember much of it. So there's a book called The Bible Designed to be Read as Living Literature, mm -hmm. the Old and New Testaments in the King James Version, edited in 19, first in 1936 by a fellow named Ernest Sutherland Bates, and it's in the chat, and it has an index. So you can go and, like, I looked up Nicodemus, didn't have uh -huh. to read the whole Bible, but it's not, it's nothing they're not trying to uh, uh, evangelical you. They're right. they're just yeah. yeah. They're just and he's kind of coy and is literate. But I just thought people want to be able to dip in. That might be something useful because right. all of your references I'm going to look up in this in this one. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. Well, well, tell us what you find. Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay. Great. Though no, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Karen. Oh, thank you all. What fun this is. What fun. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.